in creativity, just like in life, we have strategies in, in, in how we move forward that have to do with just today, the things I can do today. But then there's also things I realize, okay, I'm in a big uh, long-term commitment for something, uh, whether mm. it's relationships or it's a career. So we have to kind of look at it both. So I think creativity, what it does for us, it helps us to you know, realize that being grounded in the present and, and, and thinking and having my mind the agility to go between these two things of divergent thought versus convergent thought, the, the magic and the science, the robot and the wizard, mm -hmm. that's what creative genius is. So if I'm able to be agile in that, just like if I'm physically fit and mentally fit, I'm going to be able to handle a lot of things as they come at me, even if it's not easy. So if you have this picture in your mind of the maximum level of creative genius, right? Where you have this idea for a song and you're able to then take that idea and you're able to flesh it out into all the individual pieces. And then boom, you've got, you've got the wall by Pink Floyd or you've got whatever you're creating, right? This, this beautiful masterpiece that started as an idea. Let's say that that's the ultimate place of creative genius. What's the opposite of that? And the reason I ask you this is because I know that especially in today's world, a lot of the people listening are inside of inside of the corporate world. They're building their careers. They're starting their own business. And at times we feel like we don't even know what the next best step is to take. And then we hear these beautiful albums and we see these people who are making giant leaps in business. And we're like, what are they doing that I'm not doing? Like I, I grew up this great way. I, I speak the English language very well. I'm a smart person. I'm educated. I've got a degree, whatever it might look like there is a lot of people who just don't know what that next step is. And it's hard to tap into your creativity if you're unsure in general. And you mentioned ADHD and I gather that a lot of people in today's world, whether they're born with it or not, have this ADHD brain of distractions and always finding it difficult to focus on one thing because of all the things that are available to us. So what, what is the opposite of maximum creative genius? Is it uncertainty? Is it being lost? What does that look like? Well, that's a really interesting question because it can look like, like again, a lot of things, but creativity, here's the way to look at it. It's a process, not a product. So everybody thinks creativity is this, this, just this thing at the end. And so we always look towards the end. Um, and, but it's like looking at someone's tombstone and saying, that's your life and, or whatever, um, all the stuff that we do, the, the trophy we win, for instance, maybe not a tombstone, depending on how morbid you are, but, um, you have to think of it as process. And so in creativity, uh, the researchers have kind of agreed that there's really four ways of describing four kind of phases that you could be in. And so depending on the phase, what your next step is, is different. And the first one, when you're young or when you're new at a project or something, it's called preparation. And that's when you got to till the soil for a farmer or as a musician, I got to learn my scales. You got to basically get a lot of stuff done. It's kind of the skyscraper where all the, the infrastructure goes in, it takes a couple of years sometimes, even before you start to see beams go up. Mm -hmm. So where you are in the process, oftentimes will help you decide uh, where to take your next step. And so some, the first course step is just to prepare. And so if you're in your career, for instance, and you're preparing your portfolio or your skills, that's legitimately may feel like you're not even going forward because you're, you're still finding out your limits and things like that. Okay, so it's not necessarily a place of because it's very easy to be upset with yourself if you're unsure of what that next step is for you, if you're unsure how to flesh out that idea. But rather than be upset with ourselves, it sounds like what you're saying is take a look logically at the phase that you're in, right? Yes. So that first phase is the preparation phase, right? And are we going through these phases in each part of our life, or is our life essentially? this process of phases in itself well creativity i believe is just another way to describe what humans do when we thrive so what it looks like to not be creating is to not thriving that's to be depressed oh. to stay in your bed or yeah. whatever but it's it's a very human process so if we look at it that way um we can we can just say obviously i'm not thriving as a person so i'm not going to be moving forward as a person and so one of the myths for us artists is this tortured artist thing where you have to be kind of just in a terrible state in order to create great work. And it's been proven that's not necessarily true. It's not that you want to seek comfort, but growth 
in any kind of growth we have requires some kind of effort. What the problem, like you're kind of mentioning is, are we doing the right thing that's going to move us forward? Mm. And so one of the things I did is kind of deconstruct the, the research that I, that I read and uh, looked after. And there's basically three parts of creativity. There's discovery, there's mm. development, and there's delivery. And so the discovery phase is that preparation. It's the idea that comes to you. It's, 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 it's that part of it. The second part is, is the, the development. You got to test it. Will this really work? And the third part of it is how we get it out and construct it. So the metaphors I use is the dream, the story, and the sandbox. And so the dream is, is kind of the wizard saying, aha, there it is. Um, and then the development's kind of like, I'm actually in a sandbox. Tech people use that all the time. How do we test software in a sa sandbox? It's kind of, where's my limitations? My budget, uh, et cetera. Will this thing really withstand engineering if you're in a technical part? And then constructing it, um, getting it out to the world. And so as a musician, you know, I get the idea for the song and then I test the idea out and with a producer or my musical um, collaborators. And then there's a point where I'm actually in the studio and we're recording it and we decide this is kind of how it is. And then, then they take it from there. They master it, and which is an interesting process, the science of it. So my music goes from this dream and uh, the wizard all the way to the robot. But sometimes it starts with the robot where I have three minutes of a song, for instance. And so I use those three things to, to basically troubleshoot the question that you have. It's like, mm. why am I stuck? Well, maybe my idea needs more development. Um, or maybe in the constructing, I'm, I'm, I'm learning something. This isn't me. It's not my story. It's why the story is important. And so even if I can do it and have the budget to do it and the idea is good, maybe I shouldn't be doing it. And so I use that as a way to help us. But there's things that you mentioned there about, you know, the small and big of it. There's micro processes and there's, and there's macro processes. So in the, in creativity, just like in life, we have strategies in and how we move forward that have to do with just today, the things I can do today. But then there's also things I realize, okay, I'm in a big uh, long-term commitment for something, uh, whether mm. it's relationships or it's a career. So we have to kind of look at it both. Interesting. Okay. So I love that those, those three parts there. So we have the dream, which can also be looked at as the idea in itself. Then we have the story. And then we have the sandbox, which is the execution and the creation of that idea physically. Yeah. Okay, great. So do we have a certain amount of focus available? And, and let, let's go back to what you said about ADHD, because that, that neurodivergence, I think, is, is a really important part of this. Do you find yourself going through this dream story sandbox process with multiple things at once? Or are you focused on one thing at a time? Or is it one thing in each of the areas of your life at a time? Like how many things are, are you and how many things are we as people based on what you've seen and what you've observed as a coach, a speaker, how much are we focusing on too many things versus one thing? I think this is kind of where we look at life. You know, I have uh, mental health, I also have physical health. And so it's like, you know, my trainer, you know, uh, to help me get in shape is going to ask me to do some things um, every day, but then some things a couple times a week. Um, but then also it's up to my mindset. It's up to my mental health to say, I got to get out of bed and value that I'm going to do this. Mm. Uh, and so I think, you know, when we look at it, look at something as a process, as opposed to just the product, because it, it's overwhelming to think of being on 15 different projects, but you know, I've, <laughs> I've been there before. Uh, and this, that is kind of what life is sometimes, you know, you're, you, you have to figure out a, a new commute with a new job and things like that and, and still do your work. If you're new in a company, all these kinds of things, you know, we we have certain points that we're dealing with. So I think creativity, what it does for us, it helps us to, you know, realize that being grounded in the present and, and, and thinking and having my mind with the agility to go between these two things of divergent thought versus convergent thought that the magic and the science the robot and the wizard mm -hmm. that's what creative genius is so if i'm able to be agile in that just like if i'm physically fit and mentally fit i'm going to be able to handle a lot of things as they come at me even if it's not easy creativity is kind of this human process of how we get things done that if we can master that mindset shift quickly they they call that also lateral thinking so you have uh 
you know, um, that the default mode, which we try to get out of, which we're saying, you know, mindfulness kind of gives us, a, that's another net. It's not necessarily creativity, but it helps us to kind of just get out of all the noise, but we actually have to let noise in to say, what's actually going on with me? You know, what am I actually seeing the problem? An engineer is saying, you know, I have to look at everything here and, and not miss anything. So that's kind of the, the, the divergent thought where the convergent thoughts I've done that enough at certain points where now I have to narrow things down. And moving between those kind of mindsets quickly can allow us to manage a lot of the stressors of how we get things done. Hmm. Um, and so that's kind of how, why I look at creativity. It's not just, you know, for me as a musician, trying to figure out how to be more, you know, creative, um, get more ideas and, and et cetera. It's actually, how do I keep doing it? How do I keep getting up and making more good stuff? So this idea of the creative brain, I've never heard someone say it in that way. Is every brain creative? Are we all creative? Is it in different ways? Like when you think about the creative brain, what do you mean when you say that? It's a, a very good question to start this conversation with. And um, it's very important for us to keep in mind that uh, in, now in this dialogue, when we talk about the creative brain, we actually refer to this um, uh, mini or personal creativity that we have, each one of us, because our brain, uh, when we are born, we are born with a creative functioning. And um, this is um, something that, that um, is very important to, um, to kind of uh, relate in each one of us that we have this mini C creativity or personal creativity, which can be reflected, for instance, um, at work when uh, something unexpected happens, when, for instance, um, you have an unexpected issue with a client. And that's in that moment, um, it's a possibility, not the not the certainty, but it's a possibility that your creative functioning kicks in. It mm. depends also on how you manage to manage yourself in order to face the par particular unexpected situation. Um, and um, and uh, the more we are aware that, that um, we can work with ourselves in these moments when we, we may feel threatened, well, for instance, like you're about to close a deal with the with someone and you were expecting that it's going to be like uh, certainly signed and then it doesn't go like that, then is the time to remember, hmm, I do have this mini C creativity. Let me think, you know, what can I do? You know, how can I manage the best this situation? It doesn't mean that that you are going to save the, the deal and get the contract, but maybe you are going to tell something funny, a joke, and then you 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 may start to develop a better connection with that particular client that later may lead to to a, a deal or you you may you may uh, if if joke uh, telling a joke is not your style you may be creative in another way um, by uh, i don't know inviting them to lunch some other day you know like there's so many you know, ways uh, this mini c creativity can be manifested in these unexpected situations yeah, no, I love that description because from what you said, what you just said, it sounds like this idea of the creative brain is it's the part of the brain that's used when you're not operating on autopilot. So for a lot of our days at work, I mean, for everyone listening, think about an average day of work for you. 90% of what you're doing is very likely what you did the day before and the day before that, unless you're in an extremely creative role, mm -hmm. in which case you've already really trained this creative faculty. Mm -hmm. But most of us, including myself, 90% is what I've already been doing. But then comes what you call the threats and or the encouragements mm -hmm. where now we're taken out of this autopilot. It's like mm -hmm. when you're driving in the car and you forget the entire trip and then all of a sudden you're conscious and you're like, wow, I've been driving for the last 20 minutes, right? Yeah. But yeah. this creative brain awakens, and now you can tap into this superpower. Mm -hmm. But again, it sounds like, and correct me if I'm wrong, it sounds like this creative brain is something that you have to strengthen and work on. And like you said, be aware of it so that you can yeah. even work yeah. on it and strengthen it. Would, would you yeah. agree with that? 
I, I totally agree uh, with with what you said, and it's it's very important for us to <clears throat> to be more deliberate um, in exercising this uh, uh, creative thinking in in these situations, which we may perceive them as a, as a threat to our uh, job or to the particular uh, situation. As I said, signing a deal with a client or whatever unexpected task comes your way in in your everyday role. Um, that, so this is one way to be more deliberate about uh, exercising our mini C creativity. And I say mini C, by the way, uh, <clears throat> because um, I wouldn't want to confuse it with um, the um, uh, creativity of eminent people, like uh, the people who are having a larger scale impact on, on society. Uh, and that's why I say the mini C creativity, because it's the creative thinking that we can exercise in order to impact our local community, whether our workplace or, you know, just a particular relationship with a client or with a boss or uh, with a colleague. So that's why I refer to it mini C creativity, but it's very valuable. It's ours and we need to develop it to become a pro C creativity, a professional creativity where we already are deliberate <clears throat> about um, the situations when we can uh, use, use it. And as I said, it's very important to work with ourselves in these moments when we see threats through creative thinking, we can reframe the situation, empower ourselves and we may not even we may not be able to control it entirely, but certainly by using creativity, we can turn it more into our favor. Yes, absolutely. When did you personally become conscious of your own mini sea of creativity? When did you become conscious of the idea of the creative brain in your own life? Was it as you were developing the book or was it during the beginning of your career? Guide me through that. I'm curious to hear when you were awakened to this idea. Yeah, that's, um, I haven't thought, of, at least I haven't verbalized it. Um, for for many years, so I, I was using my uh, creative thinking unconsciously. And uh, for many years, for instance, uh, I was taking my creative thinking in the realm of theater. And I was writing theater scripts and then I did a bit of acting, even though acting was not really my thing. I was into writing uh, script plays. Mm. Uh, so, but I was doing it unconsciously or maybe because I was like convinced that, that uh, a creative individual is someone who gets involved in the um, domains of art. But then when I started to think that maybe I have this like creative brain, this mini C creativity that I can use it also in my professional life as a researcher, for instance, in a technical field. Mm -hmm. uh, that was when I discovered um, a book. Uh, I was still uh, a researcher at that time studying information systems. And that book was talking about creativity change and innovation and for me these three words creativity change innovation was like that's such an odd combination what what can it mean and and then i i it opened my eyes to the fact that um uh, there are lots of papers uh researchers studying uh, the psychology of creativity mm. but then i kind of left it aside Somehow, you know, that book remained somewhere back in my, like, uh, forgotten in my memories. And then I, some years later, I found another book <laughs> of creativity, which was quite uh, called Wired to Create. And, um, and then they were talking about the habits of highly creative people, these eminent creators. Mm. And then, then that was like the moment when I decided, you know, like, I so want to, you know, like, bring some habits into my life, habits of creativity. And not only that, I so want to specialize myself so that I can be the person who talks about how can we become more creative in our roles and more like uh, creative in our, in our everyday life. So that second book, Wired to Create, was like the moment when I decided I'm so going to become myself this expert. And at that point, I already had taken the Neuroleadership Institute coaching and I was inspired by, by what 
they are doing and the, what materials they are uh, presenting to to the coaches that they get the certificate. And I was like, I'm so going to combine these two things. My desire to become an expert in creativity with um, with the, what I've seen in the Neural Leadership Institute. Yeah, that's great. I just for for those listening, we have a lot of people on the show who also love to read. And this, for those watching, you'll be able to actually see my screen shared here. This is the book that yes. has mentioned, Wired to Create. It's by the author Scott Barry Kaufman and yeah. Carolyn Gregoire. D do you happen to remember the first book that you read that really opened your eyes to this idea of creative thinking and the faculties there? Um, yeah, uh, it's, it's uh, an author that has a Greek name. Okay. If you if you can wait a bit, I can um, see if I can find it. Yeah. But no, that was the name of the book. It was um, uh, creativity, change, and innovation. Oh, okay. And one one second, where I I should I'm have because I just you. wrote a paper recently uh, at, where I mentioned this book because uh, meanwhile uh, I got back to it I I reread it <laughs> with uh, with uh, a new interest and um, there's a couple with that name yeah yeah there there are two authors one of them uh, it's a, a Greek name. oh Constantine right yes exactly that sounds very familiar. Yeah, it's called for those listening. It's managing change, creativity, and innovation. And I'm curious to hear from you. Not to throw like all these books out there, but have you Dawson. ever? Dawson, sorry, Dawson and Andriopoulos. Okay, cool. Dawson and Andriopoulos, and they have like in 2021 they had the the uh, revised edition of the book. Oh, very nice. Okay, awesome. I'm gonna have to check that out personally. That's why I know we have we have a lot of, a lot of readers tuning in here. So, okay. So talk to me when you discovered this idea of the creative faculties that you as a writer for theater are using on a daily basis, what were some of the things that you did in order to strengthen and train your own creative faculties at that point in your life? Uh, first of all, I started to read uh, a lot, <laughs> to read the um, um, books and and research uh, on on uh, the psychology of creativity. So I started uh, broadening my uh, knowledge in in this area, and and I discovered that um, <laughs> there are so many researchers having different angles to this aspect of the creative brain, uh, neuroscience, emotions, uh, cognitive uh, scientists. Um, and, and um, the, the, this was the first thing that I did. I read a lot. You could say that I started doing my, my second PhD. Um, and then um, the other thing that I did, I kind of um, had to work with myself. The, as I was reading, I was creating uh, my own um, training packages. And I was... Um, like selling, <laughs> selling them to, to people. Uh, I, I started first with, um, with um, people who have this artistic creativity, like uh, writers, uh, but then I, I changed a lot. But that was the beginning. I, I allowed myself to experiment with the different types of audiences. And I, I said that I, I had to work a lot with myself because still uh, for me obviously this this association between cre creativity and genius was so strong and somehow i felt that um mm, you know like i'm just a tiny little ripple um yes i'm very fascinated by very attracted by the field of creativity but maybe maybe i should be just you know like uh not get involved with it but um, still somehow I was like um, and that's how I ended up writing the book because it took me many years to um, be kind with myself and and say it's okay you, you don't have to be a genius so that you can uh, become an expert in creativity and and that's when I decided that I'm gonna dare to write also a book with my own perspective to, you know, the book is in a way like I'm aiming at 
bringing a refreshing perspective in the uh, research of creativity, but I am addressing directly the public. So that was my intention with the book. So to you're... write it, yes, to write it for people who have this um, uh, suppressed creativity or not to develop creativity or people who are not very connected with their creativity. Do you know someone in your life who's able to get done in one day what it takes somebody else three days, four days, or even a week or longer to complete? How is this person able to get so much done in their life and their business? Is it because they're stronger, more educated, better equipped? No. It's because this person knows how to schedule their day for peak creative performance. And in this video, I want to give you three ways that you can do just that. So let's get right to it. The first way to schedule your day for peak creative performance is to know the night before what you're going to accomplish the next day day. And this is the important thing. I don't want you just to take a notebook or a piece of paper and write down every single little thing that you need to get done the next day. What I want you to really ask yourself right now is what are the most important things that I need to get done? What are the things that you can spend your time doing that will get the greatest result in accordance to your goals and your vision? The thing is, a lot of people spend time doing the things that aren't important for them or their business. They're not doing the things that will truly move the needle for them. And I read a book by a guy named Gary Keller called The One Thing, where he talks about eliminate all the gravel from your life. Eliminate all the little things that aren't bringing you in a great positive direction. Instead, ask yourself, what is the one thing I can do right now that will get me the greatest result on my business? What is the one thing that will make the greatest difference when it comes to me and when it comes comes to the limited amount of time that I have. And the night before, plan out what are the three things that you can do the next day that are in accordance to your one thing, the thing that will get the greatest result. Once you write down what you're going to accomplish the next day, the most important thing you can do is to order those tasks from most difficult to easiest to complete. If you truly want to perform at your peak and get the highest quality work done, which I assume you want to do because you're watching this video right now, then it's so important to tackle the most difficult thing first. I'm going to talk to you in a bit about why we do this, but think about it in terms of this. When you have a list of things to do, what is generally the number one thing that people put off and procrastinate on and avoid doing? Usually it's the thing that's going to take the most time or it's the thing that they're not most comfortable with. It's the thing on their list that's most challenging to them. And because of that, we tend to take out our smartphone and get distracted. We tend to do all these little things that don't really matter so that we can procrastinate even more on the way to doing the most challenging thing. But what feels most rewarding? Doing the thing that doesn't move the needle or tackling the objective that truly makes a difference in our business or our life. So schedule your day the night before and always tackle the most difficult challenge first. As soon as you wake up or as soon as you complete your morning ritual. Let me show you why this is so important. It's important to understand that as human beings, we only have a certain amount of willpower throughout our days. And you cannot generate more willpower. Once your willpower meter is full at the end of the day or whenever it becomes full, it makes it very difficult to complete more tasks and get more things done. So as an example, let's say you wake up first thing in the morning and you start making decisions immediately. You automatically use some of your willpower. And then you decide, well, what clothes am I going to wear today? More willpower used. And then you go to work and you spend even more of your willpower on all these different little tasks that aren't really bringing you to any specific end result. More willpower used. And by the time you've reached noon, for a lot of people, or for some other people, 3 p.m. or 4 p.m., your willpower is maxed out. You cannot use any more. And if you've saved all of the important tasks to get done at the end of the day, then what kind of quality result 
are you going to get when you complete this task? It's not going to be high quality. It's going to be bad work. It's going to be low quality. It's going to be noticed by other people. And just by looking at this willpower meter, I'm sure you can begin to understand why it's important to get the most important things done the first thing you do in the day. Get it done right away. That way you expend all of your willpower on the most important tasks. This is why you hear stories about people like Mark Zuckerberg who wears the same shirt every single day. It's not the same shirt, but he wears the same style gray shirt every day because he doesn't want to spend his willpower picking out shirts in the morning. He would rather spend that willpower doing something important and doing something productive. This is why the CEOs of many successful companies, their only role is to make a few important decisions each day or even each week. They don't really do much of anything else other than make some key quality decisions because they're put in that role to use the willpower that they have as human beings to make the important decisions. So understand the science of willpower and use it to your advantage as you complete the first most important tasks first thing in the day. The second way to schedule your day so that you can perform at your creative peak is to schedule exactly when you're going to eat your food the next day. You might be thinking, okay, you've gone off the deep end now. Why would I schedule when I eat my food? I usually eat as soon as I wake up and then in the afternoon again for lunch and then at dinner time. But check this out. The reason I recommend you schedule your meals is because of this. Let me ask you a question. How do you normally feel after a big breakfast? How do you normally feel after any big meal? Well, all the blood goes to your stomach. Your body begins to digest. It's taking all of this energy that you could be using to accomplish your difficult tasks and objectives and move the needle for your business, and it's using that energy for digestion. And digestion consumes the second most amount of energy out of anything that your body does. So I'm sure you can imagine the quality of your work and the quality of your performance after you eat a big meal. Yeah, you got it right. It's not too great. Your results are going to get worse after you eat a meal. And you're going to be thinking to yourself, Ugh, I feel kind of sluggish. I don't want to have to continue work because I just ate a big meal. I just want to sit down and I just want to relax. My advice to you is to schedule your meals at least for the afternoon time. Now this way of eating is called intermittent fasting. It's about having an eating window between a specific amount of hours, such as noon and 8 p.m., which is my personal eating window. So I won't eat a meal until after noon, which gives me all of those hours in the morning to have my peak levels of energy. And generally, if I wake up at 6 a.m. and I eat at noon, between those six hours, I'm able to get done most of the tasks on my list, if not everything. So by the time I eat, I don't need to use that energy for the important things. I can use that reduced level of energy to accomplish anything else I didn't accomplish or to spend time with my family and to do the things that I want. If you want more information on this whole eating window and on this thing called intermittent fasting, then watch the video up here that I made about a year ago that talks all about it and how you can implement it in your life. If these tips have been helpful for you so far, then please consider hitting that like button right down here right now so that this video can be shown to more people who could use these tips. And if you're new here, be sure to hit that subscribe button and hit the bell for notifications because we launch videos every Monday through Friday to help you live an extraordinary life, to get more done, and to achieve self mastery. And in tip one, I talked about how you should schedule your day the night before so that you can start work on the most important tasks the following day. But if you really want to dig in and ensure that you have the highest quality work so that you can really schedule your day to perform at your peak, then you should consider scheduling in what I call time blocks. Now, time blocks is a concept from that same book I mentioned before called The One Thing by Gary Keller. But time blocks work like this. You take a specific hour or two of your day. Gary Keller says you can do this up to four hours, maybe even more depending on what you're looking to get done. But you could take 10 a.m. 
to noon. And you can take those two hours and focus on one specific task. And you'll literally go into your calendar and in your calendar you'll write down between those times exactly what you're going to get done. I put everything in my calendar. And if you wrote down what you want to do the next day in a notebook or a journal, take those things and even put them in your calendar because if it's not in your calendar, then it doesn't exist. And time blocking, choosing two to three to four hours to have dedicated work and time to spend on one thing will truly help you to get outstanding results in your work and your life. Now, when it comes to time blocking, here's a few tips for you. Take your phone and put it on do not disturb and put it across the room. Even leave it outside your room. You don't even need your phone unless it has something to do with the work that you're doing. Because if your phone goes off while you're in your time block and you hit the Facebook icon, you just lost 15 to 30 minutes of productive work because you got sucked in and distracted to something that's not helping you move the needle. Another tip when it comes to time blocking is close the door and even put a sign on the other side of the door that says in a time blocking session and the people in your life will get to know what this means and they will respect the time that you give yourself to create outstanding results so you, you can perform at your peak and get more done. Time blocking will help to change the game for you. Just try it out. Give it a shot and I'm excited to see what you think. You mentioned pleasure and the opposite of pleasure, which is what we're we're all seeking that. When we think about why we do what we do, we're seeking pleasure. But the other side that I've always heard was we're avoiding pain. But it sounds like we're really the goal is to avoid comfort and find things that push us past that boundary, right? So my question for you is what is the relationship between crankiness and challenge and pleasure? What are the relationship between those three things? Well, it, it really is. Uh, so one of my uh, fun chapters, or I have, there's a lot of fun chapters in my book. So uh, I have a first rodeo crankosaurus. And, uh, and again, a lot of this stuff happens at work. So I'm at a mediation and uh, some attorney goes, oh, this ain't my first rodeo. And I found that funny because, you know, I, where I'm in New York and I know this guy's never been to a rodeo. He hasn't been a thousand miles to the closest rodeo. Uh, and and the, the other funny thing I said about that is we never say the same thing about a circus. Like, oh, what are you doing this weekend? Eh, I'm taking the kids to the circus. Oh, you don't look too excited. Eh, ain't my first circus. So, so I have this guy, Mr. Schlemiel. Mr. Schlemiel, uh, yeah, he's a kind of like a putz, but... But uh, he buys a chicken farm, had no chickens. Uh, so it's a chickenless chicken farm. The chickens <laughs> all cross the road to get to the other side. Why do they cross the road to get to the other side? The grass is always greener on the other side of the road. So, mm. so luck would have it. Uh, there was a sign, first rodeo competition, $500. So Mr. Schlemiel signs up for the rodeo competition, falls off. And he keeps going week after week, second, third, fourth, fifth. Finally, the t and he falls off every time. He gets two broken legs. He gets two broken arms, concussions. He has 10 teeth knocked out of his mouth. And then by the 10th rodeo, the rodeo was sick of him. They wanted to get rid of him. They put him on the most, the toughest bull that even the most experienced bull rider couldn't last two seconds on. And amazingly, Mr. Shamil uh, goes 10 minutes on this bowl until the bull falls asleep. And everybody said, how do you do it? And he goes, eh, ain't my first rodeo. <laughs> so so the, the thing about that uh, is that he kept falling off the, the, the horse, the bull, whatever, uh, but he kept getting back on. Mm -hmm. he, he didn't let that stop him. Even, even for a shlemiel, he didn't let that stop him. And uh, and that was like his cranky superpower. I'm sure he was not happy losing 10 teeth or broken arms or legs, but he still kept going. Yeah. Interesting. OK, so is crankiness a superpower for everybody or was it a superpower for him? I think um, crank I because there's so many different 
uh, characters and so many different stories um, that uh, I think crankiness could be a superpower for everybody. So I, I will definitely say that. So uh, I have uh, I have uh, I redo Cinderella, and uh, the prince was going going out with Snow White, but he broke up, off with Snow White. Do you know that Snow White was living with seven dwarves? Is the prince would have a thing about that, you know, and, <laughs> and and he kept calling them dwarves, and Snow White said they're not dwarves; they're seven cute little men. And then they break up, and she has this movie, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, which pisses yeah. the prince off even more. And uh, he has this online thing with Cinderella. Mm. Uh, so uh, Cinderella says, well, you know, I, she went online, she ordered a fairy godmother, and she expects that the fairy godmother will give her the beautiful dress and uh, the, the carriage and bring her to the ball and meet the prince. Uh, the fairy godmother comes, but uh, she comes with a megaphone. And then she starts like, you know, she gets very cranky. She had expectations of getting this beautiful dress, but she finds her voice. And her voice is her cranky superpower. And she ends up with the prince anyway. So uh, I, I, that is uh, uh, that story where it's a different way of getting your superpower, discovering your superpower. Uh, I redo The Wizard of Oz, and uh, that was a lot of fun because uh, they kept they go to the wizard, and the wizard gives them like, "Oh, here's this thing," is, and their reaction: "You're spinning my wheel." It's called spinning my wheel, cranket source, where you you think you're just spinning your wheel, you're not getting anywhere, and uh, you actually had it all along. You just, but you discover it. So uh, at the what end, do you discover what do you discover that you had all you, along? Uh, well, if if um, the scarecrow wanted a brain and uh, and the Tin Man wanted a heart and Lion wanted the courage, and in the end, uh, uh, in that that chapter, the the Lion uh, said that his brothers always told him he had to grow up here. And the wizard says, you grow up here what, uh, of what? And he said, cojones, I don't know what they are. Uh, <laughs> so uh, so the, the, the fun thing after uh, the wizard offers uh, Dorothy to go home in the hot air balloon. And I don't know about you. My parents always told me not to go in the hot air balloon with strangers when I, I, I was a little kid. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, so she's a 14 year old girl. And here's this weird old man asking her <laughs> to go on the hot air balloon to and he says yeah i haven't flown this in a long time yeah crazy so so finally the lion eats the wizard <laughs> and then awesome. everybody everybody exclaims lion you grew up here and and he and the lion happily says ain't it the truth ain't it the truth uh so so the lion discovers like he had courage all along. He had the bravery all along and, and, and everybody else actually got what they want, had it. They had it all along, but then they discovered that they had it all along. So that again, you think you're spinning your wheel mm -hmm. and getting nowhere when you may already be there or, wow. you know, so, so that was the message there. So it sounds to me at the same time, this concept of crankiness is, very crucial to be aware of the crankiness that is there. And when I say that, it sounds like the superpower is also persistence at the same time. Like, yes, these characters already had these attributes, but until they kept going, they didn't find it until they kept going. The, the guy who fell off the bull at the circus over and over and over, he didn't go home and he wasn't just pissed off and he went home and he was like, this sucks. I'm ever doing that again. He, decided to get back on the bowl and try, try again. When you're starting to cook, you might burn a meal. You, the meal might taste bad here and there. Something might be raw, right? You want to avoid that, but you don't just quit. You go back and you try again and again. Now, I have been in situations, and I know people who've been in situations where you try to do something and it doesn't work, or maybe even you write a book and no one buys it, or you start a podcast and no one listens for a year, right? How do you channel that crankiness in a way that inspires you to continue on 
and keep moving forward rather than a lo- that crankiness being overwhelming, causing it to stop you from your pursuits of continuing on. Uh, I, I could, I could say with writing and this could be like the podcast or anything you do, uh, a family member was telling me, uh, that, Oh, or criticizing, Oh, you'll never make money with books. Never make money writing a book. I've been there. And, and then, uh, I say, uh, uh, I'm making me, you know, I, I'm, I'm making me, uh, which um, is really more important than the money. You know, so I, I could not make anything. And then who am I? You know, it's just this, this. And then when I create something again, it's like creating a dinner and feeling like uh, very proud that this, wow, I did this thing. Uh, and uh, it lifts me up or uh, that, uh I could write a story or I could run a marathon that like no one's going to pay me to run a marathon that, you know, it's not, it's like painful. You're sore for a few days. Uh, so, and my marathon running just what my pr- proudest thing oh, for forever uh, because where I came from, where I, I could do three minutes on a life cycle and, uh, and, Bare, like the lowest level and, and then running a marathon. But uh, when I was 40, I decided I had run two marathons when I lost the weight and it was okay. Like it was one of those, like I did that I was on the list. I did it. Okay. Move on. Mm-hmm. And then I turned 40 in 2001. Uh, it was right after nine 11. I had signed up for the New York city marathon and I ran the New York city. I trained for like over a year awesome. and uh, I ran it in four hours and 21 minutes. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I was like a mess afterwards and, and really anybody and like for days, I was just like miserable. Uh, and anyone experiencing that say, Oh, like I'll never do that again. And that would be the normal response. And I don't know why I decided like, Oh, I'll keep, Oh, this really sucked. I'll keep <laughs> doing it. But for some reason I kept doing it. And by uh, when I turned 50 was my personal best. I did three hours and 17 minutes in New York City Marathon. And that that was like a like this great feeling where I, I'm locked in. And, uh, you know, just 50,000 runners to come under 3000 out of fi- like 29.997 out of 50,000. Mm-hmm. Uh, and being 50, I wasn't like a, a spring chicken, you know, so yeah. uh, to to feel like, like, how did I do that? Uh, yeah. And again, it was it was a lot of that perseverance, the word you use, and which is exactly right. Uh, uh, and, you know, it defines me. It's like, oh, wow, I, I got there. Uh, and I never expected. It's, it's really, uh, what, what's really fun about all this is, is doing things that uh, I never expected to do. You know, so if I say lose, I wasn't planning on losing 85 pounds. I wasn't planning on writing five books. I wasn't, you know, just what's not. And that really helps me when I get into these places where, uh, like, you know, like I hit a wall or like how, like I can't climb out and, but know that I, I have climbed out. Yeah. Like, like things, things that like, okay, this is it, you know, like, you know, back when I lost my job, I'll never, no one will ever hire me again. I'll just be sit, well, sleeping on the bench. You know, I am a failure, you know, like, and your mind goes there, you know, then my mind went there. I thought, like, I'll never work again, sort of thing, whatever. Uh, my resume, I have to explain why was I let go of this place? Why was like, what happened there? And you, you, you know, your whole, your whole being is being defensive about it's scary. It's very scary. So, uh, so overcoming that and, and knowing that, uh, uh, persevering, keep pushing, keep finding a way. Uh, and then, and then once you do all that, there, like there, there's so much gratitude. It's mm-hmm. like, you feel like someone, someone likes me, you know, up there, you know, it's just, even though like I, uh, 
ideal uh, work, but you know, it's almost like this partnership with some other being that I'm going to do a lot of work, but I'm getting something for all that work. Uh, I'm getting like some reward for it. And, and it's, it's like unimaginable. Yeah. It's really, it really is something that uh, when, when you get there, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a good feeling. 